Fight fans, welcome to the PBC Podcast, brought to you by Premier Boxing Champions with your host, Kenneth Buhari and Michael Rosenthal. Welcome everyone to the PBC Podcast. I'm Kenneth Buhari. And I'm Michael Rosenthal, editor of USA Today's Boxing Junkie. Thanks, as always, for joining us this week. What a weekend of boxing we had with the PBC on Showtime Triple Header. Mike and I have a lot to say about that in a sec. This week, we've got respected trainer Kevin Cunningham joining us. Plus, in toe-to-toe, Mike and I will select our five greatest upsets in PBC history. So, without further ado, let's just jump right into the week in review. Last Saturday, PBC on Showtime returned with a stacked triple header that lived up to its promise. And boy, did we get a shock in the main event. Chris Primetime Colbert, an unbeaten 130-pounder considered one of the rising stars in the sport, was a huge favorite against undefeated and unheralded Hector Garcia, who took the fight on three weeks' notice when WBA Super Featherweight champ Roger Gutierrez withdrew after contracting COVID. Most figured that this was a one-sided matchup, and it was. Only it was Garcia who dominated, scored one knockdown on his way to a wide 12-round unanimous decision, and handing Brooklyn's Colbert his first defeat. Mike, first let's talk about the winner. What were your thoughts on Garcia's performance? Tremendous performance. Uh, as I said last week, we didn't know much about this guy other than he was an Olympian and had some success you know, early in his pro career. Well, now we know. Uh, that dude just walked down one of the more talented guys in the game, and there was really nothing Colbert could do about it. Yeah. I was I was struck by Garcia's ferocity, number one, uh, his, his uh, fitness, his durability. He was just a monster in there, uh, machine-like. I also think he's a better, better boxer than we might realize. It was just that his physical superiority is what stood out. He dominated Colbert. You know, who yeah. saw that coming? Yeah, exactly. How, how big of an upset was this? I think it was a big upset because of the way Colbert was perceived going in. And the odds were, what, like 20 to 1, Colbert, something Jeez. like that? Uh, but again, had I been more familiar with uh, uh, Garcia's capabilities, I probably wouldn't have been so surprised. We just didn't know. Still, that was a significant upset. And it, it's going to change Garcia's life in a big way, I think. Oh, yeah, definitely. What about, what about Colbert, though? In your opinion, where did he go wrong? I'm not sure anything he didn't do anything that that caused what happened uh, or, or could do anything to change what happened garcia was just the bigger stronger better guy i can say this i i think his relative lack of power might have bit him in this fight one way to stop a hard charging guy like garcia is to get his attention you know by landing hard punishing shots you know kind of stop mm, him in his tracks yeah. i don't think colbert has those in him at least he didn't against garcia I, I, the only change of tactics I could think of is maybe when it became clear that Garcia had a physical advantage, Colbert should have used his speed and ability by shifting into like full boxing mode, try to stick and move, yeah. move, 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 move. Uh, I think that would have been extremely difficult to do though, based on what, what Garcia was bringing. Uh, I, Garcia just couldn't be stopped in that fight. Yeah, I do think he would have had better success. I don't know if that, that would have meant, you know, a different right. outcome, but and perhaps a better game plan because it seemed like, you know, I mean, at first he was sort of hanging out on the ropes the first couple rounds. That wasn't working. Um, and perhaps maybe just taking his opponent more serious. Who knows? Perhaps he just underestimated the guy. Now, in the last two, three rounds when Colbert needed a knockout to win, he sort of played keep away and didn't press the action. What did you make of that? Well, he, he gave up. I mean, he admitted it as much afterward. It, it's This is kind of a tricky situation, you know, how, how to approach this. Um, I got to think that if he thought he could turn the tide, in other words, if he thought he could knock out uh, Garcia, that he would have tried to do that. But I think he knew better than anybody else that that just wasn't going to happen. So he saw no point in taking the risk of him getting knocked out, taking, you know, undue punishment, because he already knew that nothing was going to change. On the other hand, that's not what fans want to see. Uh, fans want to see guys go out on their shield. Forgive the cliche, but but you know what I'm talking about. They want to see a guy try to the very end. 
but again, if, if, if you know it's not going to happen, then I, I get both sides. So you don't think, I mean, there are people who are, who are sort of questioning his heart and his, his character as a fighter. Yeah, well, yeah, um, that's, that's predictable. I mean, yeah, you don't do that. I mean, I don't know. Pick, pick your, the greatest warriors. Can you imagine, I don't know, pick a warrior. Uh, you, Roberto Duran comes to mind, but. Yeah, can you, can you imagine <laughs> Roberto Duran, like, uh, just, you know, quitting. Well, he did, and, didn't he? Well, well, that was a different situation that he was being humiliated that, and in a way, you know, in, in a way, Colbert kind of was, too. But but he was being humiliated. Uh, Duran was being humiliated by Len Leonard's antics, you know, more than at least as much as what was happening, you know, aside from that. Yeah. Uh, Although I think that's worse, actually, the fact that he that was enough to make him. A, uh, yeah, he just he didn't want to be the fool. Um, in this case, I just think that uh, Colbert didn't want to get take undue punishment. Uh, yeah. and, for, and for good reason, again, you know what, if, if he knew better than anybody, he goes, well, you know what, this isn't my night. This guy's, if I engage this guy, he's not going to get hurt. I'm the one that's going to get hurt. And, exactly. uh, yeah, let me just, let me just live to fight another day kind of thing. But you have to, group. yeah, but you have to understand the other side because that's the way it always is. Fans don't want to see that. They want to see you, uh, at least try. And I, and I know a lot of guys would, you know, it's real easy for uh, people on the outside who aren't in the ring taking the punch to say, wow, he should have gone out on his shield. It's real easy to say that. Um, he's in a situation where he doesn't want to get hurt um, any more than, you know, than he absolutely has to, uh, which I understand. So, yeah, it's easy to say that from the outside. But once again, I mean, I have to say I understand both sides. It's a, it's a delicate uh, balance there. Yeah, it, it certainly is. And look, you know, Garcia said after the fight, they asked him, they said, were you surprised that, you know, Colbert didn't go for a knock on the last two rounds? And he said, no, not really. You know, he landed a body shot. He said, I hit him so hard in the ninth round to the body. Um, it hurt him bad. And I and I knew he wasn't going to do anything. So Colbert was probably hurting at that time, I guess, you know, figured that yeah, it's let me just regroup, um, uh, like I said, and, and come back another day. How can Colbert bounce back from this? I guess he goes back, watches the fight, discusses what could have been done differently, kind of what we're doing right now, yeah. uh, and then just then just get back at it. I mean, the guy's still got the talent, the natural talent. He's still a good boxer. Um, and I thought Colbert handled the loss well, saying that Garcia was the better man that night. No excuses. That's exactly what, he did. what, what you need to say. Uh, he's a pretty even keel guy. You know, I think he's the kind of guy who could handle um, – you know, a hiccup like this, if you can call it that big hiccup. Uh, I think I think he'll look at this as a bad performance, but he won't panic. He's a confident guy, believes in himself. If I had to guess, I'd say he'll bounce back from this and, and have more success. Yeah, I, I spoke to him briefly uh, the day following the fight. And, um, you know, uh, he's, he was in relatively good spirits and just promised that that uh, he'll be back. What about the winner? Where do you rank Garcia? among the super featherweights today. I think you have to say he's a threat to the top guys after that performance, right? Yeah. Uh, I'd even give him a shot against Shakur Stevenson, who I think might be the best 130 pounder. Um, and remember Stevenson's style and Colbert's style, maybe not that different in some ways. Um, you know, the fight with Colbert was a title eliminator. So it looks like he might get a shot at Roger Gutierrez right. WBA belt. Um, I mean, I don't hesitate at all to say that I would pick Garcia to win that fight. I think he might be favored to win that fight after what well, we saw. Well, well, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be surprising. It wouldn't be surprising to see him win now based on uh, what we saw on Saturday night. Let's move on to the cards co-feature. Unbeaten 140-pound sensation Gary Antoine Russell taking on former 140-pound champion Victor uh, Postol. Big step up for Russell, and he passed with flying colors, stopping Postol in the 10th round. Mike... The stoppage seemed a bit premature, in my opinion, but overall, what were your thoughts on Russell's performance? Good performance. Uh, he did exactly what he came to do. I thought he boxed well. He was aggressive, but always in control, which is what he always does. Uh, and in the end, he kept his knockout streak alive against an accomplished opponent who could still fight at 38. Um, that's what I call a good night. I'll add that I probably, I'll sort of echo what you said. I probably wouldn't have stopped the fight with 29 seconds left, but yeah. that really doesn't matter that much. Russell was uh, was way ahead on the cards at the time of the stoppage. Uh, really good performance by Russell. Yeah, and, and and for what it's worth, I mean, he did. Uh, that was the first time we saw Postal visibly hurt um, during the fight, dropping his hands. But yeah, I, I I thought it was a bit uh, premature. I thought Russell looked solid. Uh, you know, I, I you know I think he learned some things in there. 
Postal was able to catch him coming in at times, and a bigger puncher could do some damage, so I think it was a good learning experience for Russell. Uh, but basically, it was just one hell of a performance. Now, did Postal seem distracted to you with his family in Ukraine? Perhaps that was weighing on his mind, or was you know was his performance kind of what you uh, expected? That's difficult to gauge, obviously, but I, I don't think so. Um, I think once a veteran like that steps into the ring, instinct yeah. sort of takes over and yeah. you focus on the task at hand. Uh, if anything, the war probably served as extra motivation for, for Postal. And, you know, of course, I can't say any of that with certainty, though. Uh, strange situation he was in, uh, sad situation that he was yeah. in in some ways. Yeah. Certainly. What about what about age and, uh, you know, uh, inactivity, Postal 38 years old? He hadn't fought about 19 months or so. Did you see any ring rust or anything like that? That's also hard to say. I don't think he was able to keep pace with Russell, who's 25 years old. You know, that might be a sign of age. That said, I don't think Postal was ever a volume puncher. I thought he looked pretty good against a rising young star. Let's let's put it this way. I think he can still hold his own against many of the top 130 pounders, even as he approaches his 40th birthday. I thought he looked okay. Yeah, absolutely. I definitely want to see him uh, in the ring again. What were your key takeaways from this fight? Well, Russell stepped up. That was the main thing from a boxing standpoint. He did to Postal what he'd been doing to lesser opponents, which was his goal. You know, make a statement against the next level guy. Uh, And I've always admired Postal now more than ever to step into the ring and face a guy like Russell under these bizarre circumstances and give a solid performance was pretty remarkable if you think about it. Uh, And he was scheduled to join his family, uh, you know, in a country that's at war with a superpower. I think he went home yesterday. Uh, my heart goes out to post all his family and guys like the Klitschko's, Oleksandr Usyk, Vasily Lomachenko. These are scary times for them and theirs. You know, boxing suddenly isn't very important to them. They got bigger, bigger fish to fry over there. Uh, it's a yeah. sad situation. Yeah, it certainly is. And speaking of, uh, you know, bigger fish to fry, I, I, on, on Russell's side, I think, Clearly, he's ready uh, for the top five or, or top 10 at 140, maybe the champions. In your opinion, where can he improve? We talked about this a little bit off the podcast, and I thought you brought up a good point. Uh, maybe Russell fights in the same gear too much. Uh, I think, as you suggested, he might you know, be even more effective if he changed speeds more often, which I think would keep his opponents guessing more than they do now. He basically is like a machine. He just comes forward and comes forward and comes forward. Uh, again, I don't want to be too critical. I think that's that uh, it's worked for him, you know, right. pretty much every one of his fights. But I think that um, if he changed things up and, and surprised his opponents a little bit more than he does, maybe he'd be even better. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think that's, you know, some of the youth there, him, him going 100 miles an hour all the time, uh, some of his youth showing up. Who would you like to see Russell face next? I think he has to face contenders, you know, from here on out, I think, if they could be made. Uh, one guy I thought of was Subriel Matias. Tell me Oof. that wouldn't tell me that wouldn't be fun. Uh, but Matias would be a handful for anybody because of his aggressive style. But I think Russell has a combination of skill and power that would actually work well against Matias. Talk about a guy who could get your attention, get, you know, get a hard charging opponent's attention with uh, power shots. You know, uh, Russell could definitely do that. Yeah, it's such a good fight that I almost want to see it when they're both at their peak. I don't know if yeah. both of them are there yet. Mm-hmm. Um because it's just that good a fight. That, look, honestly, it's it, it's a great fight. Now, what one person I thought of was uh, Batir Akhmedov, who um, gave uh, Mario Barrios hell when when they fought a, a year ago, a year or two ago. Uh, I really wish Barrios was still in the division. He'd make for a good fight for uh, Gary Antoine Russell, you know, uh, as well. But no matter what, uh, I think Russell proved that he is one of the uh, top 140 pounders, and uh, looking forward to seeing him in more. Big fights. Now, in the televised opener, we got an early candidate for fight of the year. I mean, this could have headlined any other card. IBF Super Flyweight Champion Jerwin Ancajas facing undefeated challenger Fernando Martinez. Ancajas, the first world champion under Manny Pacquiao's promotional outfit, and Martinez is promoted by none other than Marcos Maidana. Obviously, you put those two together, you've got the makings of a war, which is what fight fans were blessed with. I mean, these two went at it. Martina showed incredible stamina and work rate from rounds one through 12. And even though each round was competitive, he won a clear uh, unanimous decision to become the new 115 pound world champion. Mike, what were your thoughts on the fight? As you said, that fight was just nuts. Um, You know, obviously they're both 
like off the charts in terms of strength, fitness, their determination. Uh, you know, guys like that always make for fun fights to watch. Right. They threw a lot of punches, almost 2,000 punches, according to the punch stats. Uh, and a high percentage of those were, were power shots that mm. actually landed. So um, I just I kept thinking, is is this going to is the pace going to slow down? It, it just never did. Yeah. For, for tw- it was nuts. It was for 12 rounds. Really fun to watch. Yeah, it was a great, great fight to watch. Uh, I mean, I, I enjoyed it thoroughly. And I was surprised by by Martinez. How good is this guy? He looked really good to me. Uh, Ancas had the perfect style for Martinez, I think. You know, he comes forward almost recklessly. Uh, but he took what was given to him. And he's not just a slugger. He knows what he's doing in there. He landed 41% of his punches, which is a pretty high number. Uh, one that tells me that he's a precise puncher. And Ancas landed only 24% of his mm. shots, which might indicate that Martinez has better defensive skills than we realize. Yeah, now, even, yeah. In a, even in a firefight. Uh, and we can't forget that Ancas was making the tenth defense of his title. I think I have that right. Yeah. Uh, he is no slouch, and Martinez beat him up pretty good. Yeah, that's a good point on on defense because I noticed he did slip a lot of shots, you know, yeah, uh, which suggests to me that he he had done his homework. I, I thought he was excellent, he was a true champion, uh, based off that performance. Do you want to see a rematch? I think so. I, I imagine the second fight would be would also be entertaining, which is all, always a good thing. Uh, and Encas probably deserves a chance to regain his title. You know, he fought the guy fought his heart out. He absolutely did. I think he lost clearly, but he fought his heart heart out. Mm-hmm. I'll add this: um, he better make some changes. One yeah. one thing I couldn't understand is why he didn't change up when he was when what he was doing and when it became clear that Martinez was getting the better of the toe to toe exchanges. It just wasn't working. Um, I think. Ancas has some skills. He could have at least tried to box a little, try to do something different to sort of, you know, you know, change the tide. He just never did. Just kept coming yeah. and kept getting beat up. Yeah, it makes you wonder if he can he can do anything differently in the, uh, like, in the rematch. Yeah. You know, whether he can turn it around. Now, quick update on the prediction league standings. Mike and I are both six and four. Obviously, that will not change uh, this week. And it's time to bring in our guest. He is one of the best trainers in the world, also known as a Southpaw Whisperer. Currently, he's the man in the corner of 154-pound contender Erickson the Hammer Lubin, Kevin Cunningham. Coach K, first things first. How is uh, the weather out there? I believe you might be on the West Coast now. Are you are, are you in West Palm Beach or are you on the West Coast right now? You know, no, we moved camp to Vegas for this fight. So uh, we've been in Vegas for the last four weeks. With any reason for that or just, just a different look? Uh, we just wanted to come out and, 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 you know, be a little more secluded mm. and, uh, you know, uh, kind of, kind of, you know, use a little, get a little elevation going with the mountains out here in Mount Charleston, just kind of, kind of, um, you know, like I said, you know, you just want to get away, be a little, be a little more secluded, get a little more focused and, uh, get away from any kind of distraction friends family any any just just all distractions and just 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 wanted to you know be a kind of kind of secluded more than usual for this fight now now for you i mean obviously you've been in florida for a while now do you ever go back to uh, to st louis to to visit or is the weather uh, keeping you away oh no no i always i always go back home and visit i got uh, okay. plenty of friends and family back home so i always go home and visit but um i'm loving living in in in, in paradise in, in in west palm beach and, <laughs> and, and uh you know uh, that's something we had to get used to out here in vegas it's been a little chilly out here as opposed to being back in in, in west palm where it's pretty much 85 90 degrees every day uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Coach, uh, you uh, recently tweeted a photo of uh, Erickson Lubin, your prize pupil, wearing a shirt that said Fundora will fall while training, of course, referencing Sebastian Fundora. Uh, It was just like the shirt Marvin Hagler wore, which said Mugabe will fall before he fought John Mugabe. Can you tell us more about that old school mentality? And is that what you see in Lubin? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, Erickson re- reminds me of of the old throwback guys that that um, you know uh, wanted to fight all of the other top guys in the division, and uh, <clears throat> you know today today it's not a lot of that going on nowadays with 
you know, the best fighting the best. So, you know, he, he has, he reminds me of that old Marvin Hagler, Sugar Ray Leonard, Thomas Hearn, Duran mindset where they all, you know, um, you know, wanted to fight the, 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 the other top guys in the division. And, you know, they, those guys, you know, they didn't, they didn't look for tune-ups or any of that, any of, any of that type of thing. And, uh, that's his mindset, and that's the mindset that that you know yeah, we take into preparations for each each fight. Um, you know, it's it's everything is kind of like you know my you know I'm I'm from that throwback era, so you know my style of training is more so of a old school teacher type trainer, and and uh, um, you know, and he has that old school fighter mentality where he wants to fight all of the best guys. He, he's not ducking anybody, you know, he's not interested in any kind of tune-ups and, uh, you know, so that's, that's the approach we take into, in the way we prepare for fights. I love that. Um, you know, he's made, uh, Erickson's made a remarkable comeback. If you think about it, you know, you stopped in one round by Jamel Charlo and he's won one, one, two, three, four, five, six fights capped with that knockout of Rosario, uh, last June. Um, pretty remarkable. What do you attribute his ability to bounce back from something like that? Well, for one, you know, he's a, he's a talented fighter and, and he's got, like I said, he's got that mentality to where, uh, you know, he, he wants to fight, nothing but the other top guys in the in the division and uh you know he 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 doesn't complain i mean like he's fought for instance he's fought like three eliminators you know and this will be the fourth eliminator so i mean he's like cleaning out the division for the champions before before he can get (laughs) actually get in the ring with the champion i guess because I mean, he's fighting one top 10 contender after another. And, uh, you know, he doesn't complain. And, you know, he just, uh, you know, goes to work. And, uh, you know, he has no problem with fighting any of the top guys. So, you know, um, um, he's a good student in the gym. He works hard. And, and, uh, you know, I think we we got a great chemistry, you know, and, uh, you know, the results are showing. So you guys have been working together for nearly three years now. Uh, speaking of him being a good student, where do you think he's made the most improvements as a fighter since you started working with him? Uh, we've been working together now going on. It's been over three years, going on okay. four years. Okay. And, um, 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 you know, a lot of the things that, that we work on, uh, what 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 I did with with Erickson when he came to me is 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 just pretty much evaluated some of the some of the uh, things that he needs to uh, tighten up on some of the mistakes that he were making clean them up a little bit but pretty much enhance you know a lot of the skill and ability that he has and uh, you know from a defensive standpoint I think we worked on that a little more so uh, you know to 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 where he can. You know, learn how to, you know, use his defense to set up his offense, and 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 uh, you know, uh, he's 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 taking that pretty well, and I think he's uh, uh he's he's boxing a little, you know, he's he's more poised now as opposed to you know rushing things and being you know being over aggressive. So, but he still has that same aggression. He still takes that same aggression into into the fights he's got that aggressive mindset but he's it's, it's smart aggression now yeah it, it definitely uh shows w- what can you tell us about Fundura? what are your thoughts from a, a trainer's perspective you know i think i mean first of all he's a freak of nature in terms of being six five six six yeah. 154 pounds but i think he's a uh you know uh high he, he he's high motor you know he's he, he, he's he's very 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 he's in tip-top shape every time he comes you know every time he every time i've seen him fight he's showed up in tremendous shape he's he's busy um um you know um you know he's he, he doesn't really use his height and reach like you would think a guy with that type of 
reach and, and, and range and height and length. Uh, he, he, he likes fighting on the inside and, and, and the thing about it, he's pretty good at, he's pretty good at, you know, fighting in, in short, in short range and close quarters. So, uh, you know, I guess that works for him. So, uh, you know, I think he's, he's a tremendous young fighter. Um, you know, he's, he's being moved extremely fast and, um, you know, so, uh, it's going to be it's going to be a great fight. I think it's going to be a really really good fight. How, how do you prepare for a guy like Fedor? You mentioned his his physical dimensions. Does it require extra studying, or is this a case of Erickson having to to go in there and just uh, make the adjustments? Well, I mean, I study for any any opponent that one of my fighters are, are facing. So, um, you know, we're always going to study and 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 break down the footage on every fighty fighter that he faces but uh you know i mean he's he's you know he's fight, he's a softball you know uh yes he's six five six six but he doesn't fight extremely tall so um you know i don't think it's 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 any different preparing for him that it would be anybody else you know Coach, how do you see the fight itself playing out? Well, like I said uh, uh, with the, uh, with the previous question, um, uh, from, like I said, Fundora, he doesn't he's tall, but he he doesn't necessarily fight tall. Uh, he he doesn't he doesn't he, and and he doesn't fight tall and rangy. He's tall and rangy, but he doesn't fight tall and rangy. He likes to fight in close quarters. So, I mean, I see him being aggressive as he as he usually is, coming right right to Erickson, and uh, you know, Erickson be will be right there to meet him, right there to meet him, and and uh, I think it's going to be a very very exciting fight. I think it's I think it's going I think this fight has fight of the year. Yeah, is, is is a fight of the year candidate because both guys are are are, are pretty aggressive and uh, you know uh, you don't have to look for Fundora because he's coming right to you and 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 you know our plan is to be right there to you know you know stand our ground and meet him right in the center of the ring and, and go to work. I like I'm, it. I'm more excited about the fight than I was before. Yeah. Um, so, Coach, yeah, you're not. Yeah, it's funny because somebody asked me last week uh, about uh, the, a similar question. How did I see this fight playing out? And it's, for some reason, this fight reminds me, of every, every, you know, the more and more I prepare hammer for the fight, and the more and more I study the tape. I just I just got a feeling this fight is going to look similar to Hagler Hearns. Ooh, I like it. I don't see this I don't see this fight going the distance. Awesome, Coach. You're known as sort of a southpaw whisperer, if you will. We've seen you work with Corey Spinks, Devin Alexander, Tank Davis, now Erickson Lubin. Uh, what is it that's allowed you to have so much success in this regard? Um, well, coming from St. Louis, a lot of the old school coaches, um, they took right-handed fighters and they turned them softball. So, you know, coming from St. Louis, you see a lot of softballs, a lot of, a lot of the top fighters out of the area are softballs. And a lot of the trainers back, back there from, for, for whatever reason, they, turn fighter softball so you know uh you know i'm used to dealing with you know a lot of softball so you know that's pretty much uh it's pretty much it you know just just used to dealing with softballs you know as a amateur myself you know fighting and sparring a lot of softballs back in st louis so you know i'm used to pretty pretty used to dealing with softballs and uh you know uh pretty um you know with given the t- 
teaching a softball how to fight like a softball and use the softball advantage. You know, I'm pretty pretty good with 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 you know teaching teaching fighters how to softball fighters how to take advantage of being a softball. I should say. Got it. So it's a experience, which is obviously a big deal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we we've been talking about uh, Erickson Lubin. Are there any other guys you're working with who you're excited about or you'd want to mention? Yeah, well, working with um, um, Ammo Williams. He's coming along pretty good. Um, so you know he 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 should be the the next guy that 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 make a little noise that I'm working with. I'm working with a few other young guys right now, but. You know, they they still got a ways to go, but, you know, that's pretty much it. Now, the uh, the 154-pound division is so hot right now. It looks like uh, Jamel Charlo and, and Brian Castagna are going to fight again at some point this spring. Um, what were your thoughts on their first fight? Well, I thought it was a pretty good fight. Um, uh, I expected it to be a really competitive fight. And, um, you know, I think uh, it's going to be a pretty good fight in the rematch, but I think Charlo's going to come out on top. I think because he kind of fought a little, um, how should I say, he fought, he didn't fight like his usual self. He kind of fought off the ropes, which was a little odd. Uh, I, 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 you don't usually see him you know, backing up to the ropes and fighting off the ropes. And, and for some reason in that fight, he, he spent a lot of time backing up to the ropes and fighting off the ropes. And I, I, I think he's going to make the adjustment. And I think he's going to come out on top in the rematch. Do you think it was Castaño style maybe that sort of pushed him toward the ropes? Or what, what do you think it was? Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really think it was it – was, Castaño that really forced him to the ropes. I think because he pretty much backed up to the ropes in, in most of the instances in that fight. And, and wasn't that it wasn't the pressure of Castaño that took him to the ropes. So um, you know, Castaño he's he's a, he's a, he's a he's a really he's a really good fighter. He 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 doesn't he doesn't he, he doesn't fight with with constant pressure. He's, he's kind of like a, a in and out type of guy, he, but he puts his combinations together really well. And I think Charlo had a problem with that, you know? Interesting. So this, this is a, a general question. You've been around boxing for a long time. In your opinion, who are the best fighters in the sport today? The best fighters in, in the sport today. <clears throat> Obviously, uh, the number one fighter in the sport today, in my opinion, is Canelo Alvarez. Um, I think Canelo Alvarez, Terrence Crawford, Earl Spence, um, um, <laughs> Those are my top three. Gotcha. Well, they're not. They're they're pretty good. Um, yeah. Are there are there any young guys, any up and comers that uh, have caught your eye that uh, you think might end up being uh, end up on top? You know, up and comers. I mean, I like Secure Stevenson. I think he's going to be special. <laughs> uh, you know. Um, Um, what do you think of Jerron Ennis? Oh my God! How did how did how did I not mention Boots? Well, we're I putting think, you on the spot. <laughs> I think I think Boots is definitely going to be special, and I and I really really like Gary Antoine Russell. Wow. What did you I, think of his uh, What did you think of his fight last weekend? And I was there, and I sat oh. ringside and watched him, and. and uh, I mean that was a real test for for a kid with 14 fights. I think I think that was a real test 
uh, a solid, a solid test. And I think he passed with flying colors. Interesting. Now, in the main event, we saw Chris Colbert suffered a pretty shocking loss to, to Hector Garcia. Uh, what were your thoughts on, on that fight? Uh, man, that, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I, I, I mean, you know, Chris Colbert, that wasn't the kid that, 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 that I'm used to seeing in the ring. He, I don't know, I don't know. What 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 kind of camp he had? I don't know. I don't know what went on in, in in his preparation, but obviously something wasn't right because he didn't look like himself Saturday night. Yeah. Now it's, it's, I mean, there were a couple upsets on that card. Is there a lesson there for 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 fighters? Something you can teach young fighters seeing these guys get upset? I mean, you know, upsets. You know, you you you're gonna have upsets. You know, that's part of the game. It's part of the sport. But with, with the Chris Colbert situation, it's one thing if 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 you if 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 you sit there and you watch the fight and he's doing everything that he's capable of doing, and the other guy's just so much better that night. That's one thing. But that that wasn't the case Saturday night. I mean, Chris Colbert. Just, just. I mean, he, 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 it was like he had no legs. You know, uh, he wasn't using his his boxing ability. Uh, he, he's the quicker, faster, more talented guy, and he, he didn't fight that way. I mean, yeah. so obviously something, something, something. I don't. I mean, like I said, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not privy to how camp went or whatever, but obviously. Obviously, something wasn't right. Yeah. Now, one other question for you. There's another big fight coming up uh, April 16th, Errol Spence Jr. versus uh, your Dennis Ugas at AT&T Stadium. Can you give us your thoughts on how you think that fight is going to play out? You know, I think, I think, uh, I think Ugas is, is, is obviously Ugas comes to fight. And I think, I think Ugas is going to come out and, 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 you know, give it, give it a, give it a, give it a hundred percent, and 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 give it, give, put up a great fight. But at the end of the day, I think Earl's going, Earl's going to be victorious. He's going, he's going to show, you know, that he's the superior fighter, and uh, you know, I think he'll win. And I think Earl Spence and, and Terrence Crawford needs to happen next. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I think that's a fight a lot of people are are looking forward to, and of course we are looking forward to seeing Erickson Lubin back in the ring as well. Coach, thanks so much as always for taking the time to talk to us. Uh, we appreciate it. Hope you enjoyed the time in Vegas while you're out there, and uh, look forward to catching you at the next fight. All right, thanks for having me. It's time for Mike and I to go toe to toe. This week, we're listing our top five upsets in PBC history. Now, one note. Upsets on PBC platforms, so this does not include Andy Ruiz Jr.'s brilliant knockout of Anthony Joshua, unfortunately. However, there are some pretty damn good ones. Mike, why don't you kick it off? Okay, real quick, I just wanted to preface it by saying that uh, I tried to, when I when I made my selections, I tried to look at it from the perspective of, like, going into the fight, you know, what our right. thoughts were going into the fight. Not, not you know, retrospect, in retrospect, because obviously you see things uh, more clearly after the fact. So it's sort of like what we were thinking going into the fight. So my number five uh, might not seem like such a big upset, but I think it really was. Your Dennis Ugas versus Manny Pacquiao, oh, yeah. Yeah. August 21st, uh, 2021. I think Pacquiao was the three-to-one favorite, so technically it was an upset. Um you know, Ugas is good after all. Pacquiao was 42, uh, and he hadn't fought in two years. You know, that all added up. In retrospect, that all added up to the possibility of a of an upset. Uh, that said, I still saw it as an upset at the time. Pacquiao was coming off that decision victory over Keith Thurman in his previous fight, uh, which I also consider for this number five spot on the list, by the way. Mm. Uh, you know, because I, you know, that was essentially a 50 50 fight, but I thought Thurman was going to win. Mm. Uh, anyway, he, he looked like the Pacquiao of old in that fight, I thought. And, and then finally, Pacquiao was Pacquiao. The great ones, you know, very often find a way to pull out one more victory uh, out of their hat, if you will. Um, 
I like Ugas, so I think he's a fine boxer, but Pacquiao is an all-time great. Then Ugas, and in the fight, Ugas just outboxed him. He earned the decision, and Pacquiao retired after that. Now, that was that. Yeah, I, I consider that, but I picked your Dennis Ugas to win. You know what I mean? I picked him to win. So oh, I, That's uh, right. So you couldn't, you couldn't <laughs> call that an upset. I couldn't yeah. call it an upset. Um, but it certainly was an upset in terms of uh, – the betting odds and what the sentiment was going into the fight, it was that Pacquiao was was uh, was going to win. Pacquiao was the clear favorite heading into that fight. So that was a good one. Uh, my number five was Adam Konofsky versus Robert Hellenius. March 7th, 2020 it was the last fight before the pandemic really hit, before everything closed down and you couldn't find toilet paper anywhere for some weird reason. I remember being at the fight and we weren't even fist bumping each other we were elbow bumping because folks were so freaked out about this new thing that was going around anyway it was a great crowd at brooklyn's barclay center it was like nearly nine thousand people almost all of them there to sport uh konofsky the uh, the polish brooklynite and brooklyn of course has a huge polish population in the opposite corner, Hellenius, a guy thought to be at the tail end of his career, uh, the Nordic nightmare. He was a huge underdog against a Konofsky who was undefeated at the time and who many had pegged for big things, at the, at the very least, the world title shot. And for two rounds, Konofsky gave the fans plenty to cheer about, although I was noticing Hellenius slipping in some right hands here and there that appeared to bother uh, Konofsky a little bit. Then came the fourth round. Kanaski charged the head as always. He drove Hellenius to the ropes with a bunch of shots, but then boom, Hellenius bounces off the ropes with his right hand flush on the jaw. Uh, Kanaski goes down. He's up on wobbly legs, but the referee, David Fields, ruled it a slip. And so the action resumes. Kanaski clearly hasn't recovered. Hellenius is all over him, drives him to the canvas again. Uh, this time it is ruled a knockdown. When he gets up, Hellenius continues to pound him until the fight is waved off. And just like that, you could hear a pin drop at the Barclays Center. The crowd was so stunned. But to their credit, they applauded Hellenius and they showered Konofsky with cheers afterward, letting him know they were still in his corner. But this was definitely one of the biggest upsets in PBC history. Yeah, that's why it's on my list a little bit higher. Um, so, <laughs> so, I'll, so I'll hold off and uh, and give you my commentary when uh, with it, with that, when that time comes. Uh, sure, yeah. that's why. Um, let's move on into number four. I'll kick this one off. My uh, number four is Jarrett Hurd versus Julian Williams. May 11, 2019, Hurd was the unified Super Welterweight champion. He was taking on the once beaten uh, Williams at Eagle Bank Arena in Fairfax, Virginia, which is a stone's throw from Hurd's hometown of Aquakeek, Maryland. I mean, at that point, Hurd was an unstoppable force moving toward an undisputed matchup versus Jermel Charlo. The Williams fight was just supposed to be a mere formality, except someone forgot to tell Williams. I mean, J-Rock didn't just win. He put on a pound-for-pound -pound performance. He dropped Hurd in the second and simply dominated throughout to become the new unified 154-pound champ with an inspirational performance. Indeed. Uh, again, it's on my list uh, a little bit higher, so I'll hold off on that one, too. What do you have for number four? Uh, okay, my number four, uh, Tony Harrison versus Jermel Charlo, December 22nd, 2018. Uh, I have respect for Harrison's boxing ability and his athleticism, but I didn't see that coming. Uh, Harrison had bounced back from his knockout loss to Jared Hurt. Uh, the previous year by winning three consecutive fights, including a close decision over Ishe Smith immediately preceding his fight with Charlo. Uh, I just thought he'd either get stopped by Charlo, who was unbeaten at the time, or lose the decision, especially following that fight against Smith. Instead, Harrison was just at his absolute best. He outboxed yeah. Charlo to win a unanimous decision that I thought he deserved. Uh, of course, Charlo avenged the setback a year later by stopping Harrison. Uh, but the upset in the first fight is uh, part of the record. Yeah, it certainly is. And that was a huge upset. No one was was expecting that. Obviously, um, very, very close fight. A lot of people felt that uh, Jermel won that fight, but I don't think anyone anticipated it even being a debate um, leading into that fight. Boy, the 154-pound division, it's just yeah. a gift that uh, that, yeah. that keeps yeah, on giving. Absolutely. Let's uh, Let's go to number three. Who you got? 
Okay, so you mentioned my number three, Jared Hurd, Julian Williams, May 11, 2019. So I was one of those guys who thought that Hurd was just an absolute physical freak, a guy who was just too strong, too durable for even the best boxers that, you know, in the 154-pound division. Uh, and Williams was, uh, remember, it was knocked out by uh, Jamal Charlo a few years earlier. I thought, no way this guy could stand up to what Hurd brings. Well, Williams demonstrated that a polished, experienced boxer can overcome physical disadvantages, uh, whether perceived or real. Now, we could debate that, too, on have your hand raised. Williams basically had his way with, with Hurd and won a wide decision. That was a great night for him and a big surprise for us. Yeah, it was. It really was. It was a brilliant performance. I mean, it was a pound for pound uh, kind of great. performance. Really? Just, yeah, he just dominated. Um, my number three is Marco Huck versus Christoph Glowatsky, August 14, 2015, Prudential Center in Newark, New Jersey. Marco Huck set to make a record breaking 14th defense of his WBO Cruiserweight title against a huge underdog in Glowatsky. Glowatsky was. Uh, you know, did have the hometown crowd, uh, a Polish contingent in New Jersey, and he had his moments early on. It was some good back and forth, but then in the sixth round, Huck landed the most beautiful counter left hook you'll ever see, flooring Glavatsky. He got up, but he could barely stand. Huck went in for the kill, and Glavatsky somehow survived, and then he took control. Uh, he hurt the champ in the seventh and then knocked him out in the 11th in brutal fashion to become the new champion. Not just one of the biggest upsets in PBC history, but also one of the greatest fights in PBC history. You know what? I didn't even think about that one. That's that's a good one. I dug deep. Yeah, dug you deep did. That one. I, I'm, actually, I'm actually looking at the... Um, his rec, Marco Huck's rec, and it's not as if he'd like, it. you had any reason to think that that was going to come because right. uh, he had a he had a string of victories. Remember, he had given Alexander Povetkin uh, prob big problems uh, in, in a heavyweight fight just a That's couple right. years before that, and then yeah, mm -hmm. but Glavatsky ended up, you know, fighting well on on a number of occasions after that, so it was definitely no fluke. Yeah, great, exactly. great show. Exactly. Right, Let's go to uh, number two. My number two. I'm um, taking you back for this one as well. Joe Smith versus Andres Fanfara, June 18, 2016, at the UIC Pavilion in Chicago. Uh, Fanfara fighting in his hometown, taking on this unknown construction worker from Long Island, New York, by the name of Joe Smith Jr. Uh, Fanfara, of course, coming off an impressive win over Nathan Cleverly, and the fight was over in a blink. I, I mean, with one right hand in the first round, Smith put Fanfara to sleep and became a name, so much of a name that he earned the right to fight uh, Bernard Hopkins in his next bout after the Fanfara bout. And of course, Smith would go on to KO Hopkins, and then everyone knew about him after that, but it was the fight before Hopkins that made him known to fight fans. Uh, excellent choice. As a matter of fact, um, I'm gonna say that that probably should be on my list, but it's not. So so I'm glad, I'm glad that you mentioned it. Um, yeah, talk about digging deep. Uh, I, you know what? I was actually at that fight, and Get out of here. And, and I'm trying to remember uh, what was. Do you know? Remember what the main event was in that fight? I uh, thought that was the main event in that fight. Was it not? Or I, I don't know. At, at any rate, um, yeah, that was that was a big shocker. Remember, Fonfara had beaten um, Julio Cesar Chavez when That's he was right. still, when he still had some respect, and then Nathan Cleverly right before, uh, right. right after, right after the the Chavez fight. You know, going into this fight, so Fonfara was. Uh, huge favorite in that fight and yeah smith just nailed him yeah and, and from far was never the same after that and we know what smith's gone on to do so that was an excellent choice yeah it certainly certainly was all right it is your turn my friend uh for number number two, number two what you got you already said it robert hellenius and adam kovnatsky march 7 2020 um i think most people saw Kovnatsky was unbeaten at that time as sort of an offensive machine based on his volume punching, his ability to hurt his opponents. Uh, he beat a string of contenders that way, you know, leading up to this fight. Uh, meanwhile, Hellenius has come back and hit a snag when he was stopped by Gerald Washington the previous year. Uh, he seemed like, I, I hate to use this term, but in, in a retrospect, it doesn't matter because it turned out to be wrong, but he seemed like a has-been. He yeah. was sort of hanging on at that time. Yeah. Uh, and then they he got fought. knocked out by uh, w w w uh, Gerald Washington. Gerald Washington, just, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then they fought the fight. Uh, and Hel Helenius fought fire with fire, and Kovnatsky just couldn't handle it. You know, one thing that Helenius always had and still has is power. He's got serious power. Yeah. Um, you know, he got uh, Kovnatsky got caught again and again before finally going out in the fourth round. Didn't last very long. Uh, and to prove it was no fluke, Helenius stopped Kovnatsky in the rematch. So, yeah, dramatic, dramatic stuff. Yeah, and that rematch was even more one-sided than the yeah, uh, than, than the first fight. And now I think Hellenius is is definitely in line for a big fight. I can't wait to see him back in the ring. Let's let's go to number one. I have a feeling we have the same number one. I'm just gonna go ahead and mention mine, yeah. um, and see. But my number one is Julian J Rock Williams versus Jason Rosario. Uh, January 18, 2020, Williams was the new unified super welterweight champion, returning to his native Philly to take on Rosario at the uh, Lion Chorus Center. Williams fresh off that big upset himself when he beat uh, Jared Hurd and Rosario, who had been very, very inconsistent throughout his career up to that point, which is just a mere afterthought. But after a couple rounds, you could tell this was going to be a war. Then in the fifth, they traded hooks and Rosario took badly rock J-Rock. He just battered him. I remember that that one right uppercut, the combination dropping Williams and then the uh, the follow-up putting him away. It was just crazy to see. It's like a hometown curse or something. You know, first um, Williams beats Hurd in his hometown and then Rosario beats uh, Williams in his hometown. I mean, but man, this was as big as an upset as you'll see. Williams looked like a pound for pounder in that previous bout versus Hurd, only to be blasted out in five by uh, Rosario and and lose all his titles. Yeah, uh, that's why this is my number one. Also, I it's fascinating to to think that uh, Julian Williams was in two of the five uh, up, upsets, you know, biggest upsets in the history of PBC, one winning and one losing. It's just, that's just interesting. Yeah. Uh, Williams at the time, uh, I think you mentioned this in the previous entry, Williams at the time was considered a potential pound for pound guy. Yeah. He's not already a pound for pound guy. Uh, he had that kind of skill set and the experience and yeah. Jason Rosario wasn't on everyone's radar, even though he had some good victories going into yeah. that fight. He wasn't like a nobody. Uh, I saw I saw Rosario as a solid, tough guy who just wasn't in Williams' class. Well, yeah. Williams Williams got you know caught cut in the second round, and it was kind of downhill from there. Uh, Rosario, as as you said, Rosario just started landing some big shots, broke him down, and took him out in the fifth round. Uh, a lot has happened since Williams was upset again by Vladimir Hernandez and Rosario. I could have made this list uh, too. That right. was another huge upset. Yeah, 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 that was. Yeah, he could have been three. You're right. Could have been three of the five. Uh, and Rosario lost back-to-back uh, -back fights to Jermel Charlo and Erickson Lubin. Uh, on that night in 2020, though, Rosario gave us a career-defining upset, huge upset. Yeah, that was just a, a an unbelievable performance. He was really on point that night, and his his power just uh, showed lots of lots and lots of upsets. Really, that a uh, Caleb Plant versus Jose Uskatigi, uh is one that that came to mind that didn't make the cut, but I I thought was uh, uh, a pretty big upset. I mean, so 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 many um, uh, James Martin, Vito Melnicki. I could go on and on, lots and lots of good stuff. But I think I think we did well with this story. Oh, Michael Coffey versus Johnny Rice. Who could forget that one? Um, that was that was another surprise. But anyway, that is going to do it for this week's podcast. We'd like to thank Kevin Cunningham for stopping by, and as always, we want to thank you guys for listening. Be sure to check back in next week for more boxing chatter, more interviews right here on the PBC podcast. 